Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Content Strategy Experts podcast. Our presentation today is Content as a Service, the Backbone of Modern Content Operations. And our presenters are Devraj Singh of Adobe and Sarah O'Keefe. The Content Strategy Experts webcast is brought to you by Scriptorium. Since 1997, Scriptorium has helped companies manage, structure, organize, and distribute content in an efficient way. Before we get started, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping things. We are recording this session, and it will be available on our blog on Monday. So if you have to hop off at any time, you'll be able to catch the rest of that webcast and also share it with anyone else that you think might find it relevant and interesting. Uh, if you have any questions during the webcast, if you look uh, along the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a Q&A panel and you can drop your questions there and we will get to those questions at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass things over to Sarah and Devraj. Thanks, Elizabeth. And hi, everyone. I'm Sarah O'Keefe. Um, I'm here with Devraj Singh, who is um, not on video today, but I will hold down the fort um, on that on that side of things. So uh, Devraj and I have been working on this presentation, putting some things together, thinking about some of the big picture trends that we're seeing. And so what we wanted to share with you today was what we're seeing in terms of content as a service or CAS, and what that means for your content delivery options for the kinds of things that you might be able to do. Um, and then Devraj is going to do the cool part of the presentation where he's actually going to show you some live demos of how all this stuff is working. So I'm going to give you a little bit of the background information and the big picture, and then we'll launch into the good stuff that you're, that you're here for. So by way of a little bit of background on the two of us, uh, Devraj Singh is a senior solution consultant at Adobe and specifically works on AEM and AEM Docs, the AEM XML product, to craft solutions for customers, to figure out, you know, how do you apply those tools to specific kinds of customer problems. Um, I, as you probably know, I run a company called Scriptorium here, and we're engaged in consulting around pretty much exactly the same thing, right? Enterprise content strategy problems, content operations, how do we make this all work? So Devraj and I have been working together for, uh, well, several years <laughs> on some different projects and some different uh, ideas and scenarios. And so this, this presentation came out of that work that we've been doing together. So Devraj, welcome. And do you have audio on your end? That would be a good thing to check now. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, right, you said we have been working together uh, for about more than three years now. And uh, uh, essentially, this, this presentation is an outcome of our common understanding. Uh, I agree. Yeah. So thank you for being here. And uh, welcome to all of our participants. I wanted to start by giving you a tiny bit of background on our publishing model. And so I made a very sophisticated flowchart of what our publishing model has looked like since you know, rough, certainly 1452 or thereabouts, but actually really since forever. You write the thing down, you figure out how to render it or make copies, which, you know, traditionally was a pretty time consuming kind of thing before this very lovely printing press came along. And then you distribute it to your end users. And so some things have changed. Um, we've moved up in the world. We've moved to a digital workflow. And we have some things that work a little bit differently, but really um, the model hasn't changed. Because even in a digital workflow, we have roughly the same exact process of you write the thing, you uh, publish the thing, and you distribute the thing. Um, so if you jump to the next slide here, you'll see, you know, it's the same model, right? Um, it's digital, it's a lot faster, there's a lot less of people using printing presses or uh, modified uh, wine presses, which is what it actually started out as, a lot fewer uh, hand copying, illumination, those kinds of things from the, the really dark ages, but the process has remained the same. And so you step out, if you step out of this, out of the digital workflow, just think about the big picture, here's what it is, right? You write the thing, you format it, you publish it, you distribute it, and then you ship it over to the end user, whoever that may be, and finally they get to consume it. Now, the number one takeaway from this presentation today, other than, hey, those are cool demos, is this next concept, which is that 
content as a service is going to re is going to actually reverse your traditional publishing workflow. And so if you look at that right format distribute model, the, co the consumer is going to get a lot more control because in a content as a service model, what's going to happen is that we as content creators write the content and then we make it available, we publish it, but it's not rendered. It's not a formatted document or even a website. It's just content out there in the world, uh, actually in an API, which we'll look at, but out there in the world. And then the consumer says, hey, I want these kinds of content. Give me this content. And then the consumer gets to format that content and finally read or see or, or consume it in whatever way. So it's your end customer that at this point has, you know, three out of the five tasks, not one. They used to be relegated down to that consumption only, and now they're getting these other pieces. And so this is a really, really critical point because if you look at traditional publishing, um, we have those five steps. And if you look at content as a service, we have similar five steps, but there's a, there's a get content in there as opposed to a distribute, right? And the steps are kind of out of order and the ownership model changes, right? So in traditional publishing, as the publisher, the content creator, the content owner, I own those first four steps. And then you, the content consumer or the reader, you get that last step. And then on the cast side of the world, that uh, balance changes. So if you take a look at this next bit, you can kind of see where, that, where that's happening and um, how that balance of power is really shifting. So if you, yeah, thank you. Just a couple of builds there, there we go. So the owner, right, used to have four out of five steps and then there was a consumption, like here is a book for you, please read it. Or here's a website, you may consume it. But now we're in the CAS model and there it's, I write and I make it available. And then you as a consumer do the rest. So that's kind of where we are with CAS. And so the implication is that um, we're giving the content creators, or actually we're taking away control from the content creators, right? In a publishing model, you're the baker and you get to put all these lovely things together and you put out this lovely buffet or smorgasbord or, you know, calorie parade here. And you have all the control over what actually gets put on this buffet. The hypothetical uh, restaurant guest here has control maybe over what they choose to consume, um, but they don't really get to say, I don't want that baked good, right? Or I, I, can you take that one ingredient out? So content as a service is content or, or possibly donuts on demand. Um, as the publisher, you no longer control the endpoint. The consumer actually gets to control that. The publisher is just making stuff available, and then the consumer chooses which of these things do I want and how do I want to mix and match them? And I like my donuts with more sugar or less sugar or no gluten or whatever else we may come up with. And I think we'll we'll stop with that model because I've now beaten it to death. Um, so there's a lot of power in content as a service in this concept of we're just going to serve it up to the end point or to the customer, and then they're going to decide what they want. Now, there's a, a bit of a cautionary tale here, because as you can see from my very scientific <laughs> graphic, um, if you think about commercial tools like a, a, a Microsoft Word even, you know, a, a just any sort of publishing tool, Word, InDesign, uh, I won't date myself with PageMaker, but, you know, something like a Word or an InDesign, um, they, those are really interesting from a publishing point of view, and they're relatively easy to configure, but the level of flexibility they give you is relatively lower. Because when you pick a help authoring tool and they say, we have these five or these 10 outputs, which is wonderful, if you wanna really step outside of those five or 10 outputs, you're kind of out there in no man's land, and it's pretty difficult to fix that, right? To say, well, actually what I want to do is export to JSON. And they're like, well, we don't have JSON. And now you really have a problem. You can step up in, in flexibility and also in configuration effort by going to frameworks. So what I'm talking about here is something like DITA and the DITA Open Toolkit, where you get more flexibility. It's 
possible at least to extend that and do a lot of interesting custom things, but it's a decent amount of work. And content as a service or CAS is gonna give you max, maximum flexibility, but also the configuration effort is gonna be very, you know, significant in working through this because you're not sort of doing, again, this traditional write the content, format it, package it up and deliver it as a website or as a book or as a whatever it is you're delivering. You're, you have all these different possibilities and you really have to um, you know, lean into that and think about what your flexibility looks like. So I do wanna caution you that there, you know, there's some effort associated with this. Now, in the big picture, um, when we do this, when we think about CAS, it looks pretty much like this. You've got your content creation happening over on one side, uh, probably in some sort of authoring system, CCMS. You've got a content repository of some sort. Now, I'm calling it a repository. Very often, there it's something that allows you, that's API enabled, which means you can use software, again, to connect to it and extract information. And you have a person on the back end who reaches into the repository and asks for things. And Devraj is going to give you some really interesting examples of this that kind of make more sense than just looking at this dry graphic. But the key takeaway for me here is that that requester is not necessarily a human. The requester could actually be a system of some sort. For example, um, you could have, and, and he's going to show you this, you could have a chat bot that says, hey, I got this query, reach into the repository, get the relevant information displayed in the chat bot. So at that point, I mean, the requester, the human typed into the chat bot, but the chat bot turned that into the actual query. So the content consumer can be either human or another system. And we just don't, uh, we need to keep that in mind that that, you know, that could happen. So um, with all of that in mind, um, just keep in mind the sort of big picture view of the requester as potentially being um, another a chatbot or a diagnostic system or a learning management system retrieving content from your content management system. It could be a lot of different things going on. And so with that, you want to think a little bit about content requirements. Um, what's that going to look like? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Devraj to talk you through uh, the, I think, the gruesome technical details. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Sarah. So I think a great overview and then uh, uh, it, it all boils down to, um, as, as Sarah was uh, giving the graphical representation, when you're moving towards CAS, there is more of configuration, uh, but with that, you also get more flexibility, right? But what that configuration looks like and what all efforts are required to move towards CAS, uh, so there are two aspects. One, uh, you have to get to a system which gives you uh, certain capabilities, we'll talk about that. Uh, but the content really has to get intelligent or it has to uh, be configured in the right way so that you can deliver the right content uh, for the right platform. So essentially, there are few factors which are important. So when you're moving away from, uh, say, the traditional ways of authoring uh, to CAS, you need to make sure that the content is granular enough so that whatever is the endpoint or whoever is the requester of the content gets the right precise piece of content, right? So it has to be granular. Second, it has to be reusable so that uh, you don't have to write the same content for different platforms uh, just for meeting the CAS requirements. Uh, it has to be a common uh, content reused for all the platforms. And it has to be single source, right? It has to be kept in, a sa in the same repository for all the requirements of CAS, right? It looks, it, it sounds more like structured content which can meet these requirements, right? But it can be others too as well, right? Whereas if we look at the technology requirements or the system requirements, what all should I be able to do with that content, the granular single source or reusable content, I should be able to track updates to those so that if I am doing any updates to the so single source content, whether or not uh, can the receivers of the content be notified about uh, the fresh content or can I keep the content messaging uh, <clears throat> consistent across all the platforms? 
how can I manage such content? Um, whether or not I can uh, manage the content hierarchy or I can design the information architecture in my system. Can I apply some metadata to the content so that uh, I can find out the content in the right way? It's not just about the, the content that we are writing in inside the documents. It should also be about uh, identifying it without going into the full text of the content. You, you can say like associating some unique ID or assigning the country code or assigning some product IDs to your content so that you can easily identify that. And obviously the system should give you an ability to expose all that content through API so that you don't have to uh, push the content to the platforms. Uh, the whole concept is the requesters can pull the content in the way they want. So the APIs will not only have to expose the content so that people can extract as it is, but there should also be an ability to transform the content uh, as it is demanded, let's say uh, from XML to or to JSON or HTML or something else, right? It, had, it can be innovative in those senses, right? So what does it take to move to structured? Uh, because we, we have uh, learned about, or we have just spoken about two types of requirements. One, uh, the content requirements where uh, we said, if we want to move to CAS, it, it sounds like moving to structured, right? So if we take that as an example, so what does it take to move to structure? So you take all your legacy content or, or identify all the current sources of content and then try to transform that to structure. It can be data, it can be XML, uh, uh, but when we are moving to structure, the whole point of moving to structure is not only to make it data or XML, but also to associate the right metadata, breaking down into right uh, <clears throat> volumes or the right sizes and also making it reusable, right? Identifying the right set of pieces which can be reused in different contexts and creating a, a granular file or granular uh, content of that piece. And then letting uh, someone work on that CCMS system who can continue to uh, follow that pattern by assigning metadata and keeping those reusable content uh, in the system to make it uh, a productive system for other authors to work on. Right, so moving uh, to structure it is important and uh, while moving, these are the factors which are important. And when you move to structure, the benefits that you get obviously, right? So you have granular reusable content and the system provides you abilities to track the content, keep it single sourced and also manage it, but also deliver it using APIs. When all those things are there, then you can publish or you can push this content, uh, not only in the traditional way to platforms like a web platform or uh, to the partner portals or uh, pushing it as a PDF to, uh, to your SharePoint site, uh, those things can anyways be done, right? Because if it is structured, then you can make use of uh, tools like Data Open Toolkit or, or some other publishing engines. Uh, but in, in addition, what you get is because the CCMS system or this repository is going to give you an API first or uh, uh, API endpoints, the, the systems which are automated, like di diagnostic systems, they should be able to request the content based on some unique ID or some metadata from the system and get the content in the raw format and apply the presentation layer of their choice if they want, right? Or uh, they can be some uh, chatbot applications or they can be some personalized experiences in the external platforms. For example, searching the content from the repository uh, using the intent or the platform that the customer is using and showing the relevant content itself to the users. Right? Those are some benefits, uh, uh, but uh, Sara, do you want to speak about some more benefits here? Uh, do you think uh, I'm missing something? I know you also have experienced a lot of those things. I, I think this is right. And you know, it, it clearly, um... I usually look at this at a very high level and you know I think this level of detail is really helpful. My takeaway is simply that um, people may be able to use this content in ways that you haven't even anticipated um, because you make it available and then because I've given the end user the choice or the the client if you will the content the content requester has the ability to go in there and do what they want. Um, one thing I will mention, which is a, a kind of a, a, not a side issue, but it's kind of on top of all of these things that you're showing here, 
is accessibility. Um, if I, as the content requester, have complete control over what I deliver, then I can customize the presentation to meet my requirements and not um, you know, your assumptions about how I might want to see it or consume it, maybe not see it. Yep. So if I consolidate this all together, Right, so we know like there is a system which can manage all the structured content. Uh, if I divide this uh, this pipeline of delivering the content from this uh, API first repository, uh, this pipeline can be divided into two parts. Right, so one is uh, the traditional way where I used to push the baked content uh, to the end platforms like web, uh, PDF, HTML5, or some uh, partner portals. Right, so we call it baked because everything is already baked by the uh, uh, by your authors. They have already uh, created PDFs for different platforms or different audiences that they serve. But think about the other way, like if it is CAS, the second swim line, uh, the green one uh, in the diagram here. So, which is API driven. What it can do is, there are systems in the market which can be connected to the repository uh, where you have authored all the structured content, which is associated uh, with all uh, the, the desired metadata, metadata, using all that metadata and the granular information that is available in the repository. Uh, obviously, uh, the repository should allow an ability to not only author, but also mark the content as approved so that uh, you can make a clear uh, segregation between what can be made available to the end users. Right? So only the approved content can be accessed by the APIs or by the end user platforms through APIs. So those systems can be diagnostic system, chatbots, uh, knowledge bases, um, like people searching through the knowledge base. Um, and while they do that, right, it's, it's actually enabling faster time to market because you don't have to worry about what all platforms and I don't have to worry about uh, creating a presentation for each of those platforms which are more relevant. So the presentation can be taken care of by the platforms who are going to deliver this content on behalf of you, maybe as a content aggregator for your for your content, right? So and and all of those uh, platforms can uh, get the latest content without you having to remember what do I have to push or which latest content do I have to push to the latest uh, or to the uh, to what all platforms I was delivering this content to. Right? In addition, uh, while it is structured, one of the important things is. Uh, based on the metadata that people are pulling this content uh, from CCMS. All this content can also be dynamically filtered. You can add intelligence to the content. Uh, you can understand the intent from the query that uh, people are making to your CCMS and then deliver the content which is filtered dynamically. And we'll see some examples. We have set a few uh, scenarios around that. You can make things contextual. Uh, because let's say you are uh, accessing the content from knowledge base versus um, uh, some external application, uh, which could be a diagnostic application. So you can understand which application it is. And based on that, you can filter and you can also deliver the content which is relevant for that application. Right. So all those things, uh, definitely we say like it is all the content is served as fried, right? It is not baked. As it is demanded, uh, you uh, you deliver the content uh, based on all the metadata which is associated to it. So, what we are going to do is uh, based on this this theory, right? We'll uh, more or less focus on the content as a service part, right? So we will not uh, think about publishing the content in the traditional way, but we will have few examples like. Um, real world examples wherein if you are creating your content in structured uh, way and you're associating enough metadata to it. So applications like a chatbot wherein um, you are uh, giving the control to the end user who wants to uh, get some information from an automated chatbot. He doesn't have to raise a support ticket. He can directly uh, ask some standard questions on the chatbot. And if the information is available in the structured CCMS or repository, then you can directly get the answers to the consumer. That's one way, one application we will look at. Uh, the second could be uh, the support agent portal. So many a times we have heard uh, the support agent portals, uh, 
uh, the, the agents are generally creating some information in those portals. While they're doing that, they also want to access some standard articles. Now those could, could be technology articles or technical documentations, which exist in your uh, repository. Now, in most cases, what happens is they, they try to keep a copy of those technical documents or they, they would uh, look at the PDF documents uh, from which they can search for the information and then write their articles in the knowledge bases sometimes. Or in some cases, they also create the support tickets based on the technology articles which already exist. Now, think about a scenario where all this, all of these technology articles already exist in your CCMS and you don't want to push all this content to, uh, to the knowledge bases for the support agents to find out the content uh, in their platform. What if those support agents can actually directly access the repository or search in the repository to find the right article? Right, so that's the second application we are, we are thinking about. The third is personalized content. So uh, in this case, it could be products that a user owns, uh, but it could also be, uh, we will showcase uh, it with an example that uh, in the support portal or in, uh, in a knowledge-based platform, based on the user profile, I will be able to access or dynamically filter out the content which is already authored in the repository. Similarly, a context-aware search. So whenever you're searching through Salesforce versus web search, uh, what differences can be made with, uh, with search enabled overcast? And lastly, we will also look at an example of diagnostic, <coughs> sorry, uh, an example of diagnostic system. So many a times I, I have personally heard um, there can be some diagnostic systems like uh, a machinery which is facing an error code now a consumer wants to do a, a preliminary check or find or troubleshoot it uh, himself um, to find out what is the actual problem, if it can be fixed uh, by following some standard steps. Obviously, uh, for every product, you also author some technical documents for troubleshooting some of the standard problems. Now, if those machineries can be directly connected to a CCMS repository or a repository which is publicly available, then based on some, those, some of those error codes or the product ID uh, to uniquely identify the problem that the user is facing. If all that metadata can be passed on to the repository and the APIs can give you the information on how to troubleshoot that, that is another application of CAS with the structured content. Right. So those five examples we'll take a look at and uh, I'll uh, go into uh, the first part, but in all, the, all of those five examples, what you will notice is uh, there are a few things which are important. And uh, these are the key ingredients, I would say, uh, for uh, <clears throat> delivering fried content uh, uh, to different uh, platforms. So first is definitely uh, create the content in a structured way, uh, make it granular. Uh, we can start with bite-sized as, as topics, but it can be further granular. And we'll see some examples how uh, within a topic, we can also define some tags or conditions so that we can make it more granular for making it dynamically uh, filtered content for different requests. So that's one uh, ingredient. The second is associating the relevant metadata. Whether or not we are creating the content in a way, uh, like uh, the different topic types within data, for example, uh, task, concept, reference, topics, right? Those also have some relevance. So if that kind of metadata is available, that can obviously help us in the in finding out the right intent and getting the right content for that intent. Also, we can associate metadata like um, um, unique error code for your diagnostic, right? That could be another additional attribute at the topic level. And then the third one is obviously delivering all this over API, right? So these three things if uh, will be applicable on all the five use cases that we will be presenting as an example. So the content will be structured, there will be some metadata and the content can be exposed over API, right? And then <clears throat> the machines can obviously consume it uh, without much effort. <clears throat> Taking the first example, uh, which is the case of chatbot, right? So in this case, if you keep those three ingredients in mind, 
right? And you will uh, be able to recognize all those three in each of those examples when I present this. So one is uh, you have a CCMS where you're storing all the structured content. And the CCMS is able to deliver the content over API, right? We are taking an example of Adobe Experience Manager. Right. It's not uh, hard and fast. Uh, the, the whole idea is that it should be a repository which is API enabled and it should be able to <clears throat> manage the structured content. Right. And obviously the end user platform can be a chatbot, it could be a Slack. We will be using Slack bot as an example in this case, but it could be Telegram or it could be another chat uh, software. Now between those two, there has to be an API uh, which uh, receives all the metadata information from the end user, which is the chatbot application. And then it has to deliver that content or deliver that metadata to the CCMS, requesting for the content through an API, and then giving it back to, this, uh, to the chatbot. Right, so if we, if we look at this as an example, right? if I want to show you an example of this, uh, a real world example, what I'll do is I'll go into uh, the system here. Okay. Uh, I just had to restart the tech bot behind. Now, if That's you look at the demo is real. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, this is my tech bot, right? If I type in something like hi, so this chatbot is going to return uh, a standard response. Uh, that it is an automated chatbot. Let's say I want to ask this chatbot that I forgot my password, right? It is not a question, but uh, in a way I'm saying like, I have forgot my password. I should be given instructions to reset my password, right? So it is able to find out uh, the content relevant to my query. Let's say uh, there are uh, more queries like what is a Yeti, right? So because I have uh, configured uh, some content which is relevant to this. So if I ask about this, the chatbot is going to return me an answer uh, which talks about Yeti. Now behind this, if I go back into my system, <clears throat> right? So this is the CCMS. In that, uh, what I've done is I've created some topics for chatbot. All right, so uh, before I show you this, I will actually show you that how this, uh, the brain works behind. So, oops, sorry, yeah. So I will show you the CCMS part, the repository set apart very shortly because I'll have to connect back to uh, my VPN uh, to go into this system. But the end user platform is, uh, is the Slack, which we just saw. The brain part is actually a, a flow wherein uh, we configure how to receive an input from Slack and then how to send this request to your repository and whatever response we get from the repository, how to transform it for Slackbot, right? So your repository will have the content uh, which is in structured way, it doesn't have any presentation layer associated specific to chatbot, but it is able to deliver the content to a chatbot as well. Right, while I connect to the repository, uh, uh, sorry, if you want to speak a little about uh, chatbot over CAS, I'll quickly connect to the repository so that uh, I can show the authoring part of this. Yeah, so the if you think about this as compared to a, I can't believe I'm saying traditional chatbot, but as compared to a traditional chatbot, when you go to set up things in a chatbot, what typically happens is that you have dedicated system. So you are, I mean, at the end of the day, almost certainly exporting from your repository and uh, putting all the content into some sort of a dedicated system for the chatbot. So, I mean, that's just like an advanced version of copy and paste. So we're in a situation where you have your uh, CMS or CCMS content, and then you have to copy everything over to the chatbot, potentially rearrange it, uh, break it up, do all the things in order to get the chatbot to accept the content that you're feeding it. And so what we're, we're uh, proposing or what we're able to do in a chatbot environment with content as a service 
is that the chat bot and you know the brain, the middleware, is going to reach into the repository, the original repository, and grab what it needs and be able to break that down based on presumably the fact that you've structured, organized, and uh, labeled, whether with metadata or semantic elements, you've labeled the information in such a way that the chatbot and the chatbot brain are able to process and render it. So what we're eliminating is a copy of the content, right? And a maintenance problem. Right. And if I go back into the repository, as uh, it was mentioned by Sarah, right? So I'll just quickly do a uh, so that I'm connected to the repository. Now, if I uh, look at the content, so this is my Adobe Experience Manager repository where I'm managing all this structured content. Now in this, uh, although I have kept the chatbot as a different folder because I wanted to keep all those topics which are relevant for chatbot, but these topics can also be common to other platforms. For example, uh, um, something related to account, right? How do I reset my password, etc. Right. So these things can also be common to other platforms like Salesforce or uh, some external platforms or uh, resetting your password within your organization. Right. So these topics can be common. And within this topic, uh, <clears throat> you can also define conditions like uh, some of the steps are not relevant for chatbot. So you can always add uh, an attribute like platform, right? And add uh, the value as chatbot and differentiate it with other uh, platforms that you may have, right? So those things uh, should be provided by uh, the CCMS system and uh, anything related to the metadata, uh, you can actually associate some keyword. Like I was looking for, or got my password as a keyword uh, for chatbot. Right. So I'm using all those capabilities of structured content and uh, the CCMS capabilities to assign a metadata to it. And we'll see more examples of using metadata with content, uh, which are used by the, con uh, by the CAS services. Right. So you can create uh, structured content, uh, define keywords, define metadata, uh, break down your content into small pieces. Maybe you can start with topics first and then talking about conditions within the topics. So all that is possible, uh, but there is always a starting point when you are on structure. Right. So that's one application uh, we wanted to talk about. And I think uh, Sarah has already spoken about uh, what is the difference between when you're moving away from traditional to CAS in uh, respect to a chatbot application. Right. So the second one is a support portal, right? So wherein, uh, as I, as I said, um, in some support portals, there are uh, lack of capabilities of storing the technical content. Uh, or even if you store the technical content in those applications, you would be duplicating all that content. While you want to keep all that content in a single source, uh, which could be your uh, structured content management repository, so if it is already there, and if all that content can be exposed over API, then the search of that content can also be exposed over API so that you don't have to keep a duplicate copy. The agents will always get the latest content when they're searching for it, right? So if you take a look at an example of this. <clears throat> so what we have done is we have created a, uh, a small page on the Salesforce site. And this, is, uh, this can be built as a knowledge base um, palette for the, for the support agents. Uh, wherever they are working in the Salesforce side, uh, they can also have a palette on the right side here, right? So they can search for things like, how do I do something? Or what is some, uh, uh, what is the definition of some term whenever they are working on some uh, articles, right? So they can type something like, what is a storm cluster, for example? And when they show, uh, ask for this information, what you will notice is that uh, we are explicitly showing the type of the topics which are returned. So the intent of a concept in data is to define uh, some terms or define uh, the process of something. So if you look at the strong cluster uh, architecture overview, what you will see is it returns uh, the entire topic which has this information. Right now, this information can also be uh, granularized based on further metadata that you pass. And what I'm showing you is that 
herein you are actually passing in some parameters as well this will become more relevant when we talk about the personalization piece in the next example uh, but the whole idea is that uh, the query makes a difference for example if i search for how to add a host cluster right so the the word how is important here when you search for that it is going to return the tasks because how is generally uh, how do you do or how do you perform those steps basically right so if i look at one of those examples the, this would actually be uh, the steps and uh, we are not <clears throat> modifying the structure or modifying the uh, the output much uh, the presentation layer is very basic that we have presented here uh, but this all can also be um, further modified or further uh, transformed by the consuming applications right so <clears throat> this is important another thing is like if you just search for user account without anything uh, it can give you some uh, random uh, uh, results right you can uh, you can see a topic a task a reference right so based on that based on the topic you can look at uh, what is the user account creation process etc right so this is important when you are looking at uh, the support portal or uh, from the support agent perspective whenever they are searching can i do a advanced search on the content maybe i can have more uh, associated parameters here like uh, add some tags when i am searching the content right all those things uh, when you pass this to a, a cms repository it should be able to give you granular results and then the support agents can actually use that information to uh, to further fill the articles in the support portals in addition uh, what you can also do is uh, when i am looking at the personalized results so so there is an important factor when you are uh, working between different platforms the repository should also be able to return uh, the content in various formats as it is desired by the different applications so consider this as a different application not aem not cms and it is not a salesforce application but if you look at the type of content if i try to search for it so i can make this search result more granular i can look for audience uh, administrators right and look for this user account information right so when i look at that not only i will be presented with a granular result or the specific result which matches the criteria but i can also present this information in various formats right it can be a json output format of that particular data topic or it could be an html output right when i look at this html output you will see uh, some content right uh, an important thing here is uh, the the entire content that you see here right if i go ahead and open this in the in the editor in the cms what you will notice is uh, the content is actually bigger it has a lot of things inside and there are a few things which are important one uh, i am also assigning some conditions like which audience does this paragraph belong to right so i am having uh, the content for administrators internal users uh, as well as external users while i am also adding some uh, additional information like platform right so this particular paragraph is for salesforce platform and this one is for other platforms right so keep this this content in mind because i'm going to use this content for another example which is personalization uh, but important thing here was i can actually present the same information in various formats and i can also make the search results more granular right so i can pass on different data attributes and get the fine fine tuned results uh, just like how we saw in salesforce uh, we got four results but if i pass in the audience parameter i am getting only one and then i can present this in various formats it could be uh, html it could be uh, xml or it could be json right now if i move back and we look at uh the differences that we uh, or the advantage that we get in comparison to traditional approaches now in traditional approaches we were uh, storing all the support content in the dedicated system right or in the support portals we used to duplicate the content so that all the agents who are accessing the content locally they should be able to find it easily and they should be able to uh, find it based on the metadata that they are searching based uh, searching on in those in those cases what could have happened is uh, 
maybe if you do not synchronize the content between two systems, the search results will become inconsistent. Right? Whereas if you keep all the content in a single repository, uh, the support portal will uh, always get the latest content and it will be consistent to all other platforms uh, who are accessing the same content. Right, so those things are important when you are considering uh, CAS in terms of support coding. The next one is uh, personalization with CAS. And I'm taking exactly the same example that uh, I just presented. Uh, the important factor here is uh, we authored the content, a single topic, but it had a lot of conditions in it. We call it metadata based on the different data attributes uh, which can be associated to the content. Now, when different platforms or different uh, personas are accessing this content, uh, this content can automatically be filtered based on the parameters they pass to the CMS. For example, uh, from Salesforce, if I am accessing the content uh, as an audience internal, what you will see is there is a, a bunch of uh, bullet points and bunch of uh, numbered list and paragraphs. So this is also highlighting internal users. And if you look at the tip here, uh, this is different uh, on the platform for Salesforce versus the tip for the platform for uh, any other platform, basically, not Salesforce, right? And the audience can be administrator here, right? And exactly the same uh, example that we presented, if I look at other platforms, so consider this as other platform, and I'm looking for user account audience administrators. And if I search for that, and I look at the HTML of this, what you will see is uh, <clears throat> the content has a table, right? Administrators can actually access all the passwords. And if they have forgotten their password, this is one of the tips that, uh, that was given to the administrator of the other platforms, that you can use your local credentials for the application. While if I go back to Salesforce and look at the user creation, what you will see is that uh, I am getting uh, the result for internal users and the tip is actually different, right? And if you look at the content which was authored in uh, the system, the tip or the paragraph at the bottom, right? So I had the audience Salesforce for the SSO login tip and for the other one, I'm using the other platform, right? And in Salesforce, uh, because I'm using uh, a profile of an internal user, which I can actually change. So I'm logged in as a user whose uh, profile is right now an internal user. I can always change that to say administrator, save it. Right, I'll close this one. And if you look at the search results now, the search results would be the same, right? If I'm looking for user account, I get the same four search results, but within that, now I will get the administrator's content, but the tip would be uh, tip would still be the same, which is which was associated to the platform Salesforce, right? So that's the third example that we took for content as a service. Uh, I hope uh, uh, we are keeping track of questions. I'm not looking at the chat. If there are any questions, we can also answer those towards the end. Um, <clears throat> but moving to the next. Uh, or before that, uh, the difference that you or the or the benefit that you get on this type of application with CAS. What you can do is you don't have to uh, uh, bake all the content and deliver it for different audiences or different platforms. Uh, the CAS or the APIs can be enabled in a way that all the content can be delivered dynamically for different platform requirements and different user profile requirements. Right, so you author it once and you don't have to publish it for all the platforms and audiences. Right? And this way it is easy to manage the updates because uh, the end user platforms or the end users are actually pulling it based on the profiles that they are associated to. Right? So you avoid uh, duplicate efforts. Uh, you don't have to keep track of all the changes for all the platforms. You don't have to worry about whether all the content is updated for all the users or platforms. Right? So all those benefits you get with uh, CAS on the personalization side. The other, uh, I think this is one of the last uh, examples that I had, uh, which is diagnostic system, right? In this case, um, I wanted to keep away from uh, 
more complexities, but if you think about a diagnostic system, if we start from the right side, uh, generally the diagnostic systems which are associated to the products or any, uh, any device, what they can already do is they can, they, they, the information they have is what type of product it is. If there is any geographical uh, association to that product, for example, if there is a printer in, uh, in Europe versus printer in, uh, uh, in USA or a car or a vehicle in Europe versus vehicle in USA, right? Left-hand drive versus right-hand drive. So those kind of metadata can already be identified by the, uh, by the devices uh, which are attached to, uh, uh, to the product. Now, these diagnostic system can gather all this metadata already, or they already have it stored in their uh, memory. Now, when that information is available, let's say there is an error that happens. Now the error, if that error is known, right? So the device or this diagnostic device can identify that error code, but to show the troubleshooting steps to the user, it has to find out the latest information about it. Either you can store all, uh, all the troubleshooting steps of all the error codes into the repository, or sorry, in, into the product memory, which will uh, lead to uh, higher cost of the device, which is associated to the product. Uh, it will require more memory and the content can go outdated. So uh, people will have to upgrade their uh, diagnostic system devices associated to the product, right? If we don't do that, what can happen is the diagnostic system can gather all that metadata, send this request to a repository, uh, which can take this metadata as an input and present the troubleshooting steps to the diagnostic system. And the diagnostic system can actually present the information uh, which is more presentable or which is more understandable by the type of the user. So it, it can be the engineer is accessing the information versus an end user is accessing the information. So in this case also, not only you can author uh, how to troubleshoot the content, but you can also associate metadata like uh, uh, what is the error code for this particular troubleshooting uh, information? Uh, who are the audience? And you can define those uh, conditional attributes inside those troubleshooting steps. Like if an engineer is looking at it, you can talk more in uh, technical language. Whereas if you're looking at, uh, if an end user is requesting it, you will have to give some infographics, right? So things like that uh, will happen in this kind of system. Now, obviously I cannot bring in a vehicle in this video mode and show you how uh, the car breaks and it, it looks for the troubleshooting steps. So what I've done uh, here is I've actually uh, created another small interface, uh, which is like a diagnostic demo, right? So uh, there are some fields. So what we are saying is, let's say the diagnostic system understands the product group, whether it is personal care, manufacturing, aerospace, uh, it identifies the country and it can have more parameters, right? Or it can be some uh, search terms uh, based on which diagnostic system wants to find out uh, the troubleshooting steps. But let's say uh, um, I want to search for uh, a car trouble, right? So when I look for car trouble, I, uh, the diagnostic system already knows the uh, error code. Let's say the error code uh, looks something like this, car trouble 001. Right. So when this system sends this request to the repository, now this is going to be the unique issue ID. When I search for this, <clears throat> the system should be able to return exactly one result because this is a unique ID. Now, important thing here is that <clears throat> generally the troubleshooting steps would be <clears throat> some uh, steps within, uh, within the documentation and it would most probably be, probably be a task. Right. So if I want to present this task as JSON, uh, but I think the more important point here is whenever you are presenting this to a diagnostic system, it should ideally be some interactive HTML, right? So if you look at this HTML, if I go to the next screen, uh, it would be something like this, right? So people will have to say, okay, start the troubleshooting. The car won't start, okay? Turn the key. Uh, so there could be some steps which can be uh, authored by you in the system and it is a task, right? And this is how a task can be presented, right? And you say, okay, uh, and the last step says, uh, oh, I have taken a longer route though. So uh, yeah, so if it starts, it says, okay, have a safe trip after all this troubleshooting. 
So this can be an interactive HTML way of presenting some documents, right? If I look at the source of this content, <clears throat> right? So it is, it is nothing, but it's a simple task, which has some steps, which says turn the key uh, and listen to the sound, right? And those were the steps that we were presenting. And uh, primarily those alternate routes are defined by the choices that you are giving under the steps, right? So, one way to look at is at this is uh, a HTML, an interactive HTML, but it could also be a tree, right? So maybe an engineer is there on site and they just want to see the entire tree, right? So it could uh, probably be something like this, right? It could be turn the key to listen the sound and so on. They can look at the tree and then say, okay, um, I've solved the problem for the customer, I cl uh, close this, right? And this can be, uh, uh, there can be other examples, right? Uh, let's say, um, I think this example I, sh I showed to Sarah before the session, uh, and it was uh, funny that uh, if you have a baby trouble, right, how would you uh, handle that, right? So it would be something like um, your baby is impossible, right? How do you manage, right? Uh, do you have to change the diapers? No, right? Uh, things like that. So uh, it could be personal care, it could be manufacturing, it could be uh, other areas, but the idea is that how do you present this information over API? You have authored it once. You know that all this content is standalone. Uh, the troubleshooting information is all standalone. If there are there are no dependencies on other topics, for example, uh, you can simply uh, present this in more innovative ways over API so that your diagnostic systems can understand or the audience who are accessing this content over APIs can easily understand that. Right, so uh, those are a few examples. And if it is going to be simple XML, it can also be simple XML as well, which could uh, be uh, directly the, uh, the XML that you have authored, the entire task uh, that you have authored um, in structured content, right? So those can be different formats that you can uh, use to present your diagnostic information. Now, uh, primarily I just spoke about uh, what happens when you move this kind of information to CAS. Uh, you don't have to push all the content to the machinery, uh, into the device. Uh, you don't have to worry about the storage capacity of uh, the device which is associated to the product. Uh, you don't have to worry about the updates. You don't have to worry about keeping all the languages, uh, uh, I mean, all the content in all languages into that device, which will lead to the storage capacity issues as well. So all this can be achieved through CAS because wherever the device or wherever the product is used in the context of that, the diagnostic device associated with the product can send a request over API to the repository and get the desired information, right? Which is less complex, uh, gives more uh, uh, relevant content and more fresh content, right? So uh, I think um, I'll switch this back to Sarah. Uh, to speak more or summarize uh, the concept again. Thanks, Devraj. I, I love the diagnostic example. We have seen this and we've seen the storage issues. Um, you do, of course, have to have the machine itself with an internet or at least a repository connection, which can be a challenge. Um, just a couple of key things here. One is that when you start talking about content as a service, what you're actually doing is decoupling the content from the delivery layer. And although we've been talking about separation of content and formatting for a really long time, typically we do still wrap those together before making the content available to the end user. And that, that changes here. Um, so you kind of have this middleware layer that's just the content, which is fine. And then one other kind of, I guess, side note that goes with this, um, Content as a service makes it potentially possible to solve some of our siloing issues and deliver a unified content experience. So what I mean by that is that let's say that you have a, a PLM, a, a product lifecycle management system, which contains your product data, the um, height and width and weight and various kinds of characteristics of your product. And what you actually want to do is give people a product description, which lives in your content, but also all these specs, which live in your PLM. Well, you could write connectors or create connectors to those two separate databases and then unify the content for presentation at the point of request. Um, we have been trying to figure out, you know, how do we unify content? 
when you have multiple sources, multiple silos, and don't necessarily have the option of, for example, uh, subsuming all the product data into the content uh, into the content layer. And so I think this gives us one more tool or one more way to potentially uh, combine and integrate those things as we move towards some sort of a unified content presentation. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Difraj did a great job of talking through all of these issues, but basically, um, I, I would not suggest that CAS is for everybody, um, but I would say that these are some of the things that it opens up for you. So if, if these are issues that you're facing, then, then CAS is probably something to take a look at. So do you need to give your consumers more control over their content? Uh, a different way of asking that is, do you have so many variants and so many conditionals in your content that it is practically, as a practical matter, impossible to deliver all those variants because there are just too many? Would it be easier to let people tick off a couple of choices and then get specifically what they need? Uh, content on demand <clears throat> is a big concern and a big consideration. I just mentioned integration with other data sources. Um, Devraj gave you a great example of personalization. Um, if we, if you as the content consumer are logged into the system, then we know some things about you. You know, we know who you are. We know maybe what products you've bought or licensed. Uh, if we're dealing with hardware and you're a service tech, we probably know some things about the machines that you're servicing, that your organization has purchased. So we can personalize the content to your requirements and your needs. Um, you know, the regional, the regional issues would be interesting, or perhaps you have a preferred language for the content that you want that differs from the locale. So perhaps you work in a factory in Germany, but your native language is um, something else, is French or Spanish, or um, so you might want to see those operating instructions in your preferred language, not in the language of the place that you currently are. Uh, and finally, you can decouple, again, decouple the content from the delivery and give yourself some more additional flexibility there. So these are kind of the things I see as um, possibilities for CAS. And I'm hoping that that gives you some ideas for where you are with this. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Elizabeth. We are so very out of time. Um, we we yes. slid right into the end there. Um, but we do have contact information here for the two of us. And I think if you would like to reach out to us in that way, we will be more than happy to try and answer your questions. Yes, I don't want to keep anybody uh, since we are over time. So if you do have any questions, please contact Devraj or Sarah at the emails here. Um, you can also drop your questions into the Q&A panel uh, and your email and I can have them reach out to you. Um, but with that, we are going to go ahead and wrap up. So thank you so much, Sarah and Devraj. That was a great presentation. Thank you. And thank you, Devraj. Thank you. And thank you all for attending the Content Strategy Experts webcast. Follow us on Twitter at Scriptorium for upcoming events. And I believe the next event that we will be at is LavaCon. So we hope to see you there virtually.